Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about Wichita and Kansas government and public affairs. We're broadcast on KGPT Channel 26.1, also its companion website, kgpt26.com. Some of you may know me for my blog, The Voice for Liberty, at, on the internet at wichitaliberty.org. The motto there is Individual Liberty, Limited Government, and Free Markets in Wichita and Kansas. So I cover things that may not be covered by other news media in Wichita and Kansas, or if we do cover the same news, I'll cover it from the perspective of economic freedom, limited government, and individual liberty. These are the things that are important. These are also the things that are so often under attack by our governments, be it at the federal, state, or local level. So, please visit wichitaliberty.org. You can subscribe to the email newsletter I send two or three times a week. You can like the Voice for Liberty on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. And if you'd like to contact me, my email address is easy to remember, bob.weeks at gmail.com. If you read newspapers carefully and try to take them seriously, you'd run the risk of proving what H.L. Mencken said, which is, a newspaper is a device for making the ignorant more ignorant and the crazy crazier. And I've noticed that how Wichita Eagle news stories label outside organizations is a window into the ideology of the paper's newsroom. As an example, A a recent Wichita Eagle op-ed piece referenced a report released by two think tanks, the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy and also the Kansas Center for Economic Growth. This was an item titled, Kansas Tax System Among the Most Regressive, and it appeared on January 18th of this year. Now here's what readers can learn about the mindset of the Wichita Eagle. These organizations were named simply named and referred to without labels, adjectives, or qualifications that give readers clues about the ideology of the organizations. Now that would not be remarkable, except for noticing the contrast in how the Eagle labels conservative and libertarian organizations, most notably Kansas Policy Institute. A quick use of Google finds these mentions of KPI in recent Eagle pieces. Dave Traubert, president of the Kansas Policy Institute and an outspoken advocate for conservative education reforms. Another was the Kansas Policy Institute, a free market think tank linked to Coke Industries. And then the Kansas Policy Institute, a conservative think tank. And there were many other examples. Always, a reference to Kansas Policy Institute includes a description of the organization politics. Now, the Eagle Eagle is not inaccurate, I want you to understand, because Kansas Policy Institute is conservative and free market. But contrast with these recent excerpts from other Wichita Eagle stories. Dwayne Gosen is a senior fellow at the Kansas Center for Economic Growth. Another reference was, said Anita McKay, director of the Kansas Center for Economic Growth. And another was, according to an analysis by the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy based in Washington, D.C. Well, in one other example, the Eagle slipped and labeled ITEP as liberal-leaning. And that's actually a general characterization of this institute, which in reality lies quite far left on the left end of the political spectrum, as does Kansas Center for Economic Growth. But the use of a label shows that someone at one time was aware of ITEP's policies and politics. So, why does the Wichita Eagle routinely label Kansas Policy Institute, but never or rarely labels Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy or the Kansas Center for Economic Growth? Now, we know the editorial page of the Wichita Eagle is liberal, favoring progressive policies of more taxes and larger government over economic freedom, almost without exception. We see, too, that the newsroom shares the same view, as shown by the sampling of references above. Labeling a source as conservative, free market, and linked to Coke Industries is not meant by the Wichita Eagle to be a compliment. These labels are meant as sort of a warning signal to Eagle readers. 
But the Wichita Eagle may not realize that the people of Wichita and Kansas are largely conservative. On the other hand, the average person does not read the newspaper any longer. Now, since I wrote about this, someone called my attention to an instance where the Eagle referenced Kansas Policy Institute without using a label like conservative or free market. So that's either the exception that proves the rule, or maybe someone at the Eagle slipped up. Oh, a note. The two outfits the op-ed op relied upon produce much content that is demonstrably wrong. The Tax Foundation has found many serious problems with the report that, that is the subject of the Wichita Eagle op-ed, and you can find those articles at wichitaliberty.org. Here's something else I noticed this week. Kansas Governor Sam Brownback delivered his annual State of the State Address. And Kansas Senator Anthony Hensley delivered a response. And in that, he told a story designed to generate sympathy for working mothers at the expense of Kansas Governor Sam Brambach. But the story is based upon arithmetic that is not plausible. Hensley said, according to the printed remarks, Take, for example, the single mother who works full-time and lives within her means, but still struggles to provide for her family. Now, that's something that we, someone we can emphasize with, and also someone who is a key Democratic Party constituent. Here's the burden she faced under Brownback's tax plan, according to Senator Hensley. He said, she paid $4,000 more in income taxes due to the governor's plan. Now, when I heard Senator Hensley say that on television, I thought surely he had misread or misspoke. $4,000 in Kansas state income taxes is a lot of taxes. You have to have a pretty good income to have to pay $4,000 in Kansas state income taxes, much less to pay $4,000 more, as Hensley said. But $4,000 is in the prepared remarks is made available by the Kansas Democratic Party. You'd have to think that someone proofread and checked the senator's arithmetic, wouldn't you? So I made a few assumptions and worked through some, some uh, tax arithmetic. And I found that a single person with two children would have to have federal adjusted gross income of $94,000 in order to owe $4,000 in Kansas state income taxes. Presumably, Hensley said she paid 4000 more, so this fictitious worker made even more than that to begin with. Now, I'm not an income tax expert, so I could be off by a little. There could be other changes in tax law, but I don't think they could have had near the impact that Senator Hensley described. So I'm pretty sure Anthony Hensley and the Kansas Democrats are way wrong on this. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks. Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach is proposing to add an option for straight party ticket voting in Kansas elections. If enacted, voters would be able to take one action, one pull of the lever, so to speak, and cast a vote for all candidates of a party for all offices. Kobach says this would save time in the voting booth and cut down on lines at election places. There's also the issue that voting on down-ballot contests typically trails off. That is, people may vote for offices at the top of the ballot, things like president, senator, governor, but then stop voting. So offices like judges and dog catcher and issues like raising taxes may receive fewer votes. Well, I see a few issues with this plan. First, what if a party does not field a candidate for an office? A notable and prominent example is the recent election in which the Kansas Democratic Party did not have a candidate for a major office, that of United States Senator. So what if the person pulls the straight Democratic Party lever, or checks the box is more likely? Who will get their vote for Senator? Will the voting machine present an exception to the voter and ask them to make a selection for Senator? Conceivably, this could be done with voting machines, which, after all, are computers. 
But what about those who vote using paper ballots, like all of the advanced voters who vote by mail? Other parties, such as the Libertarian Party, may also have a problem in this way, as the party may not have candidates for all offices. But here's something else. The ballot items for judges on the Court of Appeals and Supreme Court are of the form, shall Justice so-and-so be retained, yes or no? So if a voter votes a straight party ballot for the sake of time and convenience, the things that are so important to the Secretary of State, Will the voter take the time to vote on these judicial retention matters? On the other hand, does anyone really know anything about these judges? Here's another problem. Initiatives are not associated with a party. An example is the recent Wichita sales tax question where voters selected either yes or no. This matter was way down the ballot below the judicial retention elections. And like initiatives, referenda are not associated with the party. And questions regarding the adoption of constitutional amendments are not associated with the party. They appear near the end of ballots. Then undervoting, that is, not casting a vote for any candidate for an office, is a perfectly acceptable choice that a voter might choose to make. There have been many times where I thought that none of the candidates for an office were worthy of my vote. Therefore, I voted for no one. A related consideration. I don't think Kansas needs an insurance commissioner. Therefore, I voted for none of the candidates. And Gidget, you remember her, one of my favorite Kansas bloggers? She explained a similar issue. She wrote, And I know of several people of integrity who leave blanks on their ballots because they don't feel informed enough to vote in a particular race. I am so okay with that, she said. The last thing we need is to force the dum-dums out there to blindly pick a side. I'd prefer they pay some attention to the issues and the candidates. That was Gidget. So, given the above considerations, do you think one-touch, straight-ticket voting will improve participation in down-ballot issues? More votes may be cast, but do you think they'd be informed votes? I don't think so. There's also been legislation introduced in Topeka this year to raise the minimum wage in Kansas. It sounds like a good idea but it will harm the most vulnerable workers and make it more difficult for low-skill workers to get started in the labor market. Now, the proposed bill would raise the minimum wage in Kansas by $1 per hour each year until it reaches $10.25 per hour in 2018. And the bill's caption or title reads, Enacting the Kansas Working Families Pay Raise Act. Well, that caption, referencing working families, hints at the problem, at least as seen by liberals and progressives, which is that the minimum wage does not generate enough income to raise a family. And while the bill calls for raising the minimum wage, it makes no reference as whether workers are raising a family or working part-time for pin money while in high school. But aside from that, there is an important question to consider. Will raising the minimum wage help or harm low-wage earners? The answer is that a higher minimum wage harms low-wage workers and low-skilled people who would like to work or who need to work. Now, the great appeal of a higher minimum wage is that it seems like a magical way to increase the well-being of low-wage workers. And it is true. Those who were earning less than the new lawful minimum wage and who keep their jobs after the increase, well, they're happy. They are grateful to the lawmakers, labor leaders, newspaper editorial writers, and others who pleaded for the higher minimum wage. News stories will report their good fortune. That is the visible effect of raising the minimum wage. But to understand the entire issue, we must look for the unseen effects. And the not-so-visible effect of the higher wage law is that demand for labor will be reduced. Those workers whose productivity lies below the new lawful wage rate 
they're in danger of losing their jobs. I understand it is harsh and unpleasant to say that someone's later labor productivity is not as high as the cost of employing them. It seems like we're saying that a person is not worth a certain wage, but it's their labor productivity that we're referring to. And harsh or not, it's the way the world works. Most employers cannot afford to retain unproductive workers. If they do, the company will soon have no workers. Remember, after all, the minimum wage law says if you hire someone, you must pay them a certain amount. The law does not compel you to hire someone. The law cannot force employers to keep workers on the payroll. And the difficulty in seeing the effect of the higher minimum wage is that people will lose their jobs in dribs and drabs. A few workers here, a few over there. These former workers may not know who, to, who is to blame for their job loss. Newspaper and television reporters will not seek out these people as they are largely invisible, especially so for the people who are not hired because of the higher minimum wage. And in the real world, business owners have many things they can do when labor becomes more expensive. Some things employers do to compensate for higher labor costs include these. They may reduce non-wage benefits such as health insurance. Some may eliminate the overtime hours that many employees rely on. We will see more substitution of machines for labor, such as more self-service checkout lanes at supermarkets, more automated ordering systems at fast food restaurants, and more use of automated telephone response systems, for example. Some employers may use more illegal labor. Examples of that include paying employees under the table or requiring work off the clock. And some employers may be more willing to bear the risks of using undocumented workers who often can't complain that they are not being paid the minimum wage. And some employers may simply decide that the risks and hassles of being in business are not worth it anymore and just close up their shops. So if we are truly concerned about the plight of low-wage workers, we can face some harsh realities and deal with them openly. And the simple fact is that some people are not able to produce output that our economy values very much. They are not very productive. And passing a law that requires employers to pay them more doesn't change the fact that their productivity is low. But there are ways to increase productivity. One way to increase workers' productivity is through education. But unfortunately, we see ample evidence that our public education system is not working well. And capital, that's another way to increase wages. That may be a dirty word to some. But as the economist Walter E. Williams says, ask yourself this question. Who earns the higher wage? A man digging a ditch with a shovel or a man digging a ditch using a power backhoe? Well, the difference between the two is that the man with the backhoe is much more produ productive. And that productivity, which allows the worker to earn a higher wage, is provided by capital. That is, the savings that someone accumulated and invested in a piece of equipment that increased the output of a worker. Education and capital accumulation are the two best ways to increase the productivity and the wages of workers. Ironically, the people who are most vocal about raising wages through minimum wage laws are also usually opposed to meaningful education reform and school choice. Instead, they insist on more resources being poured into the present system. They also usually support higher taxes on both individuals and businesses, which make it harder to accumulate capital. These organizations should examine the effects of the policies they promote as they are not in alignment with their stated goals. And by the way, just this week, President Obama proposed higher capital gains taxes. Now, if it were simply possible to increase prosperity by simply enacting a higher minimum wage, we should do it. 
But that's not the way the world works regarding minimum wage laws. We have to remember, who was harmed the most by minimum wage laws? It is the unskilled worker, which unfortunately are often poor and minority. We mean to help these people, but the law hurts them most. But some people like a higher minimum wage. Workers who belong to labor unions usually make more than the minimum wage, but unions tell their members that if the minimum wage rises, so too will their wages. And what about large companies? Well, in 2005, Walmart was in favor of raising the minimum wage. Why? Well, Walmart already paid its employees more than the minimum wage. But many of its competitors did not pay wages that high. So, if the minimum wage rose, these competitors to Walmart would be forced to increase their wages. Their costs would rise. Their ability to compete with Walmart would be harmed. Walmart supported government regulation in the form of a higher minimum wage as a way to impose higher costs on its competitors. It found a way to gain a competitive advantage by using government. And it did this while appearing noble. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks. We've talked a bit about capitalism and free enterprise today about how these are better for low-skill and new workers than raising the minimum wage. There are people much better than I to explain some of these concepts. In the following video, Arthur Brooks of the American Enterprise Institute explains some of the myths and realities regarding capitalism. Here are five myths about free enterprise. Myth number one, free enterprise hurts the poor. Since 1970, the percentage of the world's population living on the equivalent of less than a dollar a day has fallen by more than 80%. This was not the result of foreign aid or UN development projects. It was the spread of free enterprise that achieved this miracle. In China alone, free trade and foreign investment, investment not aid, lifted 400 million Chinese out of abject poverty in just the 20 years between 1981 and 2001. There has never been a force for helping the poor that has come close to free enterprise. Myth number two, free enterprise is driven by greed. If entrepreneurs were all about money, they'd be far better off getting a secure job in civil service. According to a recent survey by CareerBuilder.com, small business owners made 19% less money per year than government managers. Entrepreneurs are driven by a fierce desire to control their own destiny. They strive for something I call earned success. For some people, earned success means business success. For others, it means raising good kids, building a nonprofit, or making beautiful art. Whatever allows people to create value in their lives and in the lives of others. Only free enterprise gives them the personal freedom to do that. Myth number three, free enterprise breeds envy. Since 1973, the General Social Survey has asked Americans whether they believe good luck or hard work is more important than getting ahead. For 40 years, between 60 and 70 percent of Americans have chosen hard work. In a recent poll, the Pew Research Center found that 88 percent of Americans said they admired people who get rich by working hard. This view is unique to the United States. According to the World Values Survey, Americans are more likely than those of other nations to attribute success to hard work. Americans are twice as likely to do so than the French. In a society that rewards initiative and offers opportunity, free enterprise fosters aspiration and ambition. It is societies that have much less economic freedom and far fewer entrepreneurs, and therefore economic stagnation, that you find envy, resentment, and often unrest. This is the case in Europe where people demand more and more government benefits instead of demanding to keep more of what they earn. Myth number four, free enterprise caused the Great Recession. It wasn't free enterprise that was at fault, it was the lack of free enterprise. Statism and its codependent spouse, corporate cronyism, melted down our economy. As my American Enterprise Institute colleague Peter Wallison has documented, two decades of misguided government policy created the conditions that led to the housing bubble. 
When housing prices collapsed, so did the whole financial system. And who showed up first in the bailout line? Large corporations, including car companies, big banks, and the government-backed mortgage giants Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. This isn't the free market at work. Not even close. It's a toxic mix of big government and its corporate clients. The solution is more free enterprise, where entrepreneurs put their money on the line and earn a profit or suffer a loss. Myth number five, free enterprise is unfair. When I was an economics professor, my students would sometimes argue that it was not fair for the rich to have so much more than the poor. So halfway through the course, I proposed that a quarter of the points earned by the top half of the class be passed on to the students in the lower half to improve grade equality. All of a sudden, discussion about fairness ended. We all acknowledge that some income redistribution is necessary to pay for government and to finance a social safety net. But as long as people are free to earn money, some will earn more than others. For a majority of Americans, fairness is not redistributing wealth. Fairness is rewarding merit, and that's what free enterprise does. Free enterprise, like freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and freedom of religion, makes our nation more fair, not less. I'm Arthur Brooks, president of the American Enterprise Institute for Prager University.